Hey everybody, this is Chris McKee with Alamo Music Center in San Antonio, Texas. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. Today we're doing a Guitar 101 video for you, talking about the anatomy that makes up an acoustic guitar. If you're shopping for a guitar, you may be overwhelmed by all the features, the things that we even talk about in this video, wondering what the heck does all that mean and what does it matter anyway? So the goal is to help you understand the parts that make up a guitar and why it's important to pay attention to them. Uh, if you've been playing guitar for a while, you probably don't need to watch this, but sometimes I'm surprised by the things that people don't know about their own instruments. So maybe you ought to stick around and find out what you do and don't know. So an acoustic guitar is a design that goes back hundreds of years, first starting in a classical guitar and then to a steel string guitar like I have in my lap here. Uh, steel string guitars started uh, back in the 1800s and have been continually refined to today built in factories from the get-go. They have a simplistic design, but there's small little things that make a big difference in the tone and feel that you get out of the guitar. So let's get started. The guitar is primarily made up of two parts. It's a body and a neck. There's aspects and parts to that body and that neck and parts to the, of the construction of both that really matter. So the guitar on this, uh, or this guitar, has a body that is a dreadnought body. This is a Yamaha um, A1R, by the way. Great guitar. And it features a dreadnought shaped body, which is kind of a larger body guitar. And so sometimes there's smaller bodies, sometimes there's bigger bodies. So you can have anything from a parlor or concert size to a dreadnought or even a jumbo. And the size matters based upon your size. So you're going to be more comfortable on one versus the other and on the response that the instrument has. Some guitars have a pickup, but generally when we say an acoustic guitar, primarily it's an acoustic instrument, which means without electricity. You play the string, you pluck the string, it creates sound. And based upon the dimensions of that body, it's going to create a very loud sound or a smaller sound, have more bass or more treble. And so the shape of the body, the size of the body is really, really important, both for your comfort and for the response and tone that you get out of the instrument. We're going to stay here for a little bit because we're going to talk about the construction of the body. Now, a guitar, an acoustic guitar, can be made of either solid materials, layered or laminate materials, or a combination of both. This particular guitar, and most guitars in this price range, which is kind of the mid to lower hundreds, um, is a solid spruce top with laminate or layered back and sides. Okay, now that term can mean different things. Sometimes it means something kind of like formica, where it's a man-made material with a grain kind of printed on it. Other times it really means layers of wood. So it's very thin laminates or, uh, or veneers of wood that are all glued together, and they make up the back and sides of a lot of acoustic guitars. And that makes for a very strong, robust construction that's very, very stable. But it doesn't move very much because it's so strong and stiff. The top of an acoustic guitar is where most of the sound comes from. So if you can, usually you want to aim for a guitar that at least has a solid top. And regardless of the material, whether it's spruce or cedar or mahogany, it's going to give you a better sound because it's solid. It's actually moving more because it's not as stiff as a laminate material. It's also going to imdo the instrument with certain tonality. So a spruce top sounds different than a mahogany top, which sounds different than a cedar top, which sounds different than a redwood top, and so on. Now the back and sides do matter when it comes to tone as well. So when you have an instrument where the back and sides are also solid wood, that kind of acts like the EQ of the guitar. It's going to give you more bass or more treble or dampen some frequencies and accentuate other frequencies so that it's taking the basic sound of the guitar and then turning it up in the bass or in the treble or in the mid-range. And they also have different figures. So maple can be very striking, ebony, rosewoods. They all have a different look to them. And a general rule of thumb on the back and sides, general rule of thumb is the darker the wood, the darker that it sounds, the more bass it has. And the lighter the wood, the lighter the sound is on the tonal spectrum on the back and sides. So again, could be all solid, could be uh, all laminate, or it could be a mix of them. And it really matters to the 
longevity, the sound, and the response of the guitar. So make sure that you find out when you're shopping for one. Now the body has binding on it, okay, uh, for the most part. And that binding is this uh, lighter colored strip of wood that you see on this particular guitar. It could be plastic, it could be wood. It might not have any binding at all, uh, depending upon the type of guitar it is. But that binding basically serves two functions. It looks nice and it protects the guitar. So if you bump the edge of the guitar and say that binding cracks, it's the binding and not the top. Okay, so it's there to act as a buffer for the guitar. And like I said, it looks pretty. The guitar is going to be finished in something, okay? Uh, in this particular case, it's a glossy finish. Sometimes it's satin, which means there's not a lot of shine to it. And there's different finishes out there that have different thicknesses, and they'll affect the sound and the look of the guitar. So something to pay attention to as well. And then, of course, you have the bridge here. The bridge is the primary uh, anchor point for the strings onto the top of the guitar. Now, a bridge is usually made of either ebony or rosewood or some similar material to that. Sometimes walnut might be used or some cousin of rosewood might be used. Uh, but it's a strong material that functions with the bracing inside the guitar in order to give it some structural rigidity, allow the strings to have an anchor point, and serve as the, the primary communication to the top of the guitar. So when you pluck a string, it goes through that bridge and moves the top. And inside, something that you can't see is bracing. That bracing uh, determines how the top is allowed to move. There's fan bracing, which is pretty typical on classical guitars, X bracing, which most steel string guitars have, V bracing, which is something new from Taylor, and a lot of variations. Because the bracing is how an instrument maker voices their instrument. How much sustain it has, how much volume it has, how much bass, how much treble, all of that comes from the internal bracing, telling the top, you can move this way, you can move this way, but you can't move this way, okay? So that's the idea behind the bracing inside of the guitar. Now also, glued to the top on most guitars, but not all, and glued into the body on most guitars, but not all, is the neck and the fretboard. They act as one unit. Now on some guitars, like a Taylor, these are actually bolted in place. Um, other guitar makers do that, like Breedlove or Collings. Um, a lot of other makers glue theirs in, like Martin and Gibson, this Yamaha. They're glued in using either uh, dovetail neck joint or some other variation of that. But the neck and the fingerboard act as one unit. So the neck is a material that's a very nice, stiff, solid material. In this case, it's uh, NATO. A lot of times it's mahogany or sapele or something similar to that Spanish cedar. And then the fretboard is laminated to the top of the neck, and that's usually ebony or rosewood predominantly, and sometimes other materials are used. Into this fretboard are the frets, and they are actually uh, have slots cut in there, and they're pressed in and sometimes also glued into place. And the frets and the neck are really important because that is the primary tactile point for you and the guitar. So as, the, instru as the, the instrument and the musician, you're holding this and fretting these notes. If the neck is too thick, or the, the strings are too high off the fretboard, or the frets feel sharp, or they're too round, or they're too flat, any of these things, it's gonna be uncomfortable, and you're just not gonna play well. So it's something you wanna pay very close attention to. There might be all sorts of ornamentation on this, all sorts of different inlays, or it might just be basic dot, or it might just be nothing. The bottom line is, this is where you are going to shorten the vibrating length of the string to create different notes. And so it's really important that you are comfortable here and that you buy a guitar that is well constructed with a nice straight neck, um, a good feeling fingerboard. It's not too wide, it's not too narrow, and it doesn't have action or height of the string that's too far away from the frets. Now as we move up the neck, we eventually reach this point here at the very end of the fretboard. And we have this piece that's called the nut. The nut serves a number of purposes and it's very, very important to the action and sound and tuning stability of the guitar. The nut acts as kind of like a bridge, but let's not confuse it with the bridge, okay? Uh, it acts as a point for the strings to pass over. Okay, there are slots cut into this nut that the strings fit into and then go down to these tuning posts on the headstock. Now, the nut can be made of a number of materials plastic, some kind of resin, uh, bone, or a synthetic bone, 
or even wood on certain guitars. Uh, but most common is plastic, bone, or synthetic version of bone, and each has its benefits to it. Now, the string passes over the nut, and the width of that nut determines the width of the neck at this point. So when you're shopping a guitar, you might see things that are in fractions or in millimeters. A 43 millimeter nut, one and three quarters, one and 11 sixteenths. What that's talking about is the width across here. And that's important for a lot of players because once you find what you're comfortable with, you usually want to stick to guitars that are within that realm, okay? Even if it's a fraction of an inch different, it can change the way you, you feel when you grab the neck, uh, the neck uh, near the nut, as well as the spacing of the strings. So we have the width of the neck, the spacing of the strings, okay? And also tuning stability. Now, how does the nut determine that? Well, it depends upon if it's installed and cut correctly. So if you've ever picked up a guitar in a store, and, or you own a guitar and you start to tune it and you hear a little pink, 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 like a little high pitched sound, what is happening is that the wrap of the string is actually getting caught in the slot of the nut. And it's kind of passing through there. So it's getting caught and then moving, getting caught and then moving. And you can imagine that that doesn't make for very good tuning stability. Because if, if it's caught and you've got some tension back here, while you're playing, it'll probably slip and then suddenly your note is flat. So you want to make sure that that's not happening, that it's a properly installed cut nut. Um, also, if the nut is too high, so if the slots aren't cut low enough or if the nut itself is too high, the strings are going to be high up off the fretboard and it's going to be very uncomfortable, particularly kind of in the first position here in the first three or four frets. So it's something you want to pay attention to. And then past the nut, you have the headstock. Now the headstock is basically just the top of the neck and on most acoustic guitars you can see it's angled back, okay, creating a breakover angle at the nut and then allowing the string to go to the tuning post for these tuners. Now most tuners are like this, they're closed tuners, sometimes there's open gear tuners. Um, classical guitars might have slotted headstocks, some steel string guitars have slotted headstocks with tuners that are different. They all serve the same purpose. They're geared tuners that allow you to turn the tuner button, okay, to, to then turn the post. And it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. There's, on a lot of tuners, maybe a 14, 18, or 21-to-one ratio. So for, say, every 18 turns of this, the post turns once. That allows me to get more precise, accurate tuning uh, up here at the headstock, rather than if I was just turning it one-to-one. -one. It's kind of hard to get it perfectly tuned that way. So that in a nutshell is uh, the construction of the guitar. There are a few add-on features that not every guitar has that we want to point out. And I did want to bring, come back to the bridge here because there's two uh, aspects of the bridge that a lot of people uh, forget about. And that is the saddle and the bridge pins. Now, not all uh, bridges have bridge pins. There are some that are string through bridges. Those are less common. But all these are are anchor points for the strings. That's it. Sometimes they're more uh, ornate uh, they're made of different materials, but all they do is hold the ball end of the string under the top of the guitar and ensure that they don't move. And then on the bridge is the saddle here, and the saddle serves to basically allow the strings to pass over, and it can be adjustable, um, not easily, but it can be sanded, or you can have a taller or lower saddle. Um, there's a precise height for a guitar to be set at, and a lot of times there's a pickup under there as well. So it's not something you want to go messing with on your own, but that is what that part of the bridge is. Now I mentioned pickup, and some acoustic guitars have these, so let's talk about them. There are a variety of pickups out there that allow you to amplify your guitar. Plug it in just like you would an electric guitar and play at church or on stage or at a coffee shop, what have you. All of those guitars have some type of uh, system to pick up the vibration of the strings. Sometimes it's magnetic, sometimes it's a piezo system like this underneath the saddle that's picking up the vibration through the saddle. Most of them have a preamp like this. Controls in the side of the guitar, sometimes they're up here, sometimes they're in the sound hole so that it doesn't cut a hole in the side to control tone and volume at a minimum and sometimes also have a built-in tuner like this uh, guitar does. And a lot of those guitars come with a cutaway like this guitar does. So all that does is cut away some of the material just like it sounds and allows you to get better access to the higher registers of the, uh, the neck. A lot of guitar players will never use that, but prefer the look of it. Other players like me, we play up there, and so kind of find a cutaway to be necessary. And finally, you want to hold the guitar to your body with a strap. 
okay? Most classical guitars do not have strap buttons. Most acoustic guitars at least have one down here at the end block, the, most, uh, the strongest portion of the body where there's an end block holding all these pieces of wood together. Sometimes there's one up here on the neck, like on this guitar, but not always. Sometimes you have to tie it up here at uh, just behind the nut on the headstock. So when you're shopping for a guitar, pay attention to that. Does it have a second strap button? Because if you plan to stand up and play with one, you might be uncomfortable with a, a strap mounted over to this point, and that might be an important feature for you to have. So in a nutshell, that's the anatomy of an acoustic guitar. All in all, these little pieces add up to make the instrument as a whole. Each one plays its part and each one's really important to know and understand so you can be a better informed buyer. So I hope that helps. Hey, thanks so much for watching the videos we put out on YouTube. We make these with the goal of helping you find the right instrument to suit your needs, to find the perfect fit so that you find the right guitar and bring many years of joy. We believe strongly that if you play a note, it can change your life. But if you're shopping for a guitar right now, you may be overwhelmed by the amount of choices that are available. Should you get an acoustic guitar, an electric guitar, a classical guitar? Which features matter, price points, things like that. It can be overwhelming. And for that reason, I've written a guitar buyer's guide called Don't Get a Good Deal on the Wrong Guitar. Follow the link below to download this very comprehensive guide that will talk about every aspect that you should be paying attention to when it comes to purchasing a new guitar. If you ever have questions or need help, go to our website, alamomusic.com. We're here to help. Thanks.